Shut up! Welcome back to Conversations with Carol and Cheryl. Today we have a special guest, extern Eric. He comes to us from via California slash Vermont, and he's going to share some stories with us about his work in Vermont, California, and in Washington, D.C. So, Eric, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm from northern Vermont, in between Burlington, Vermont, and Montreal, on a border town. Ten minutes from the border is where I grew up. Very small population. The town is about 4,000 people at most. Very spread out, mostly farmland. I moved to Santa Barbara about three years ago. Drove across country and did a cross-country trip. And now I'm at University of California, Santa Barbara, hoping to finish up my undergrad. Really happy with my move. And now I'm in Washington, D.C. for an internship for the summer. Okay, so how old were you when you left Vermont? I was 18 and turned 19 the first month I moved to California. I chose California because of the weather. Growing up in Vermont, I uh, never adapted to the cold. I knew the UC system was affordable if I was able to gain residency to the state of California. I knew the schools were really um, prestige. I knew there's a lot of opportunity with economics, the California economy. Just always wanted to live in Southern California due to having family living there and seeing it when I was younger. So that's why I decided to drive out and give it a test. So tell us a little bit about your drive across the country. So I started driving. I took a very northern route. First part of the drive, I booked it, made it to Ohio by the end of the night. Slept in Ohio, drove to Denver, Colorado, ended up meeting up with a friend who lives there, and we did about a three-week tour around Colorado before I left again to Southern California. Went to a lot of national parks, some concerts. It was my second time in the Boulder area. Had a lot of fun and we just toured all around Colorado for about two to three weeks. Um, it was snowing in late May, so we spent a few days digging ourselves out. And then I uh, drove from there 14 hours straight to Southern California and lived with my aunt for about two to three months. So tell us about your work. What was your first job? My first job was a dairy farm where I would hay, do hay bales, stack them in a really, really hot hay loft. I would pick sweet corn in the morning and then sell it at a stand in the afternoon. And then I'd also do barn chores, which is feeding calves, milking the cows, raking the stalls, scraping poop around, just all the simple barn chores. And so this was in Vermont, right? Northern Vermont. And how old were you? I was 12 when I started. Okay. So what was your favorite part of that job? I liked picking the corn, but the only downfall was walking through the plants. It made you really itchy, so I liked selling it more. I hated haying. I didn't mind barn chores. It's just some of the cows would kick at you, they'd poop and they'd pee on you. Ugh. They'd be stuck on you for days. Stuck on you for days? Yeah, the cow poop will really stick to your skin. Really? Yeah, because you, you finish working with it and by that time it's like on you. Wow. Yeah, so it takes a few days to get it off if you don't have like um industrial wash. Did you ever do cow tipping? No, never tip cows. <laughs> <laughs> That's no. a big thing up there. Okay, so then what was your next job after barn, um, your barn job? Dear? My next job was a nighttime janitor position at the gym I went to. Um, it was a gym dash pool. So I ended up working for the pool later in my uh, high school career. But to start out with, I was just the janitor. I cleaned for about two to three hours at night. Pretty simple. I started working on an organic farm down the road a few months after taking the janitor position. Um, the organic farm was... It was a, a interesting job, but I'm glad it was seasonal. So what did you do there? Pick produce in the morning for the stand so they'd have enough for the day. And then from there, I'd be assigned a project by the owner. The owner was a really hippie type. Uh, working for them was interesting. They seemed to be nice people since they're all about love and being a hippie, but <laughs> he's the only manager who's thrown something at me. They didn't train me. I was working with a girl who was my manager at the time, who dropped out of school, went on a spirit journey in the Adirondack Mountains in New York, and changed her name to something ridiculous. Her armpit hair was longer than mine. I couldn't eat lunch in the same building as her. She smelled so bad. <laughs> Did she have cow poo on her skin? No, it was pure B.O. Oh, it, gross. So um, is it what she called her journey, a spiritual journey? 
Oh yeah, she would tell us all the drugs she had taken that morning. She was always on something. It was very interesting. Wow. Sometimes we would work in the tomato shed if it was raining out. We'd just cut tomatoes, fill the stand up with tomatoes, set up a lot of electric fences, and that was very dangerous. Did you have training? No training. Okay, so then uh, what was your favorite part of that job? I considered it free breakfast. I'd eat whatever we're picking for produce that day. I'd eat that for breakfast. I also like the proximity. It was about a five to 10 minute walk on the state highway to get to the farm. I just walked on the shoulder. From your house? Yeah. Was that dangerous? It was, it was probably illegal, but it was such a short distance, nothing bad ever happened. So what was your next job? My next job after the dairy farm, the organic farm and the janitor position was pool secretary at pool dash gym that I was cleaning at prior. It was a really, really good job. It was really laid back. Um, I was able to do homework, some really nice customers. I really liked the people I worked with. We just got some very interesting characters that would come into the pool because it was a, a rehabilitation pool as well as recreational pool. So we'd have a lot of old people. Uh, Tootsie or... Rolls in the pool? <laughs> well, <laughs> we had this one lady. She's known as crazy lady around town, rolls up in her wheelchair. Right when she rolls herself into the building, you can hear her. And then she starts going off on whoever she sees. She's a really angry, miserable woman. And I was the only one at the job who could deal with her. And then after two months of dealing with her negative attitude, I had enough and she was only allowed in the pool for a certain amount of time because she would take forever to get out of the pool and you'd be after hours for about an hour waiting for her. So after two months of harassing people in the pool, harassing the pool workers, I had text my boss and told him I couldn't do it anymore. He was fine with it. So her last day before they're about to give her her eviction letter, she's in the pool and they're walking up to give it to her and they're really scared because they're like, she's gonna go off for a long time on us and we're gonna get a ton of phone calls. And she's getting out of the water out of nowhere and they're wondering what's going on. And she ends up shitting her pants in the pool. Oh Oh my God. About a Tootsie Roll. (laughs) (laughs) This is before they even hand her the eviction letter. So she shits her pants. She walks all around the pool area before Uh, telling anyone. Gets it all over. It's like all dripping. Oh, (laughs) Oh, gross. And then when my coworker who happened to be there on the shift, she gets stuck cleaning it. (gasps) The lady gives her crap after she picks up her crap. (laughs) And is telling my coworker that's her fault. She crapped her pants in the pool. But on her final day, she really went out with a bang. <laughs> and after she shit her pants and they cleaned it all up for her, they gave her eviction letter and she just went off on them. But yeah, that's how the pool. Well, you earned dropped. every penny there. Yeah, I had a stalker too. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, tell us that. <laughs> he was this really lonely older guy. And I felt bad for him because I knew he was lonely, but he started getting weird, like sexually weird to like my coworkers who were all female, then myself, he started getting weird too. He'd call the phone at the pool and talk for hours, and I would just have the phone up, and I would just be doing my homework. I wouldn't hear anything, and he'd be going, I timed at two and a half hours, and I could pick up the phone and be like, well, I gotta go, and then he'd be like, okay, that's fine, and then... Aww. So he would just talk and you'd have the phone there and you wouldn't say, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, it wasn't enough to my ear. I just had it just sitting there. And yeah. if another person was calling, I would t- I just put him on hold without him even knowing it. I think you should change your major because I think you have a natural calling to being a psychiatrist or social yeah. worker. <laughs> he became the stalker when he started messaging me on Facebook. All my other coworkers already de- blocked him. But I made the mistake of going to his house and helping him move some of his furniture that he claimed he couldn't lift because he had recently had an injury and that's why he was at the pool. He was doing rehabilitation. So my brother and I go to his house and he's moving out because him and his wife just divorced and he's really sad and lonely and injured. How old is this guy? 50-ish. Um, that's old. <laughs> so he wouldn't let us leave. He, we, he wasn't like in front of the door, but he kept talking and talking. You could see the mania in his face and his eyes, and he just was scared to be alone. And we had to pretty much just open the door and walk out. We moved the stuff within 10 to 15 minutes, and we were there for over an hour and 15 minutes because he wouldn't stop talking. And then he was messaging me on Facebook for the longest. I deleted him. He made a new account. Messaged me saying how he didn't know what went wrong with our relationship and oh. why it got really weird at the end. Did you ever rescue anybody at the pool? No, I never had any lifeguard situations. The only people I rescued were the people being harassed by the crazy lady in the wheelchair. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She would wheel right up to them and rip them a new Just one. Just blast them. Oh, yeah. Why didn't you hook her up with the guy? 
The lonely guy. She was too crazy for him. When she rolled up in her wheelchair, he bolted, which was, I kind of, that's why I appreciated her, because she would get rid of him for me, <laughs> but then I was stuck with her, which is even worse. <laughs> Yeah, so that was my pool job. So where did you go from the pool? From the pool, I went to a valet position at a Toyota dealership in Burlington, which is where I was going to school at University of Vermont. That was an all right job. Nothing crazy ever happened there. Just your average car dealership job. I guess it was a valet job with no tips, which kind of sucked. The first day I was working, my coworker was backing me up. And I was telling him, we don't even need to pull this. Like, I was really confused because I was the new guy. I was telling him, like, why don't we just leave the car here? There's no rush. We weren't busy. And he's like, oh, I'm trying to show you a trick. So he's backing me up. And there's a wheel on the back of the Toyota RAV4 backing me up. And that gets pressed into the grill of a brand new, like, $50,000 Forerunner. Quickly starts knocking for me to pull forward. And he's like, oh, yeah, you got to pull forward. I'm like... So I pull forward, I'm like, did you really just back me into a car? Because he was backing me up, right. and he's like, I got He's you. guiding it's fine. you. And then the service desk comes over, and they start yelling at him, like, what are you doing? We told you to stop doing this. And they're taking pictures of the front of the car. They're checking for damage. I didn't get in any trouble, but that was my first day of valeting, was my coworker doing something he wasn't supposed to have us do and backing me into a car. I didn't want to do it, but I thought that was pretty funny and that's probably the only incident I ever had at that job it was just very why did he do that yeah did he get in trouble also yeah he got in trouble the next day I didn't get in any trouble because they're like there's no backup camera so you can't see and he was telling you to keep going so there was a witness the guy in the service oh, center everybody was yelling what are you doing the yeah. whole time yeah I think his mom was a lady at the pool <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> So what was your favorite part about that job? Um, was the discounted labor for maintenance on my car and the discounted parts. Hmm. I was able to fix my car very well before I drove cross country. Excellent. Was that your plan when you took the job? No, I was just desperate for money, wanted something close. I always wanted to valet, so I thought that would help me get my foot in the door, and it did. And um, it was four hour shifts, so it wasn't anything too hectic with my school schedule. It wasn't the worst job, and it wasn't the best. What was your favorite part of UBM? Definitely leaving it. I really, <laughs> I really didn't have any good experiences with it. I wasn't impressed with the classes. I wasn't. The buildings were all right, but I'd seen them my whole life, so they're nothing new. Student body's really not that fun. It's very snobby of a school. It's very wealthy New England, and it's not that. Depending on your major, it's not the hardest school to get into. So it's pretty big party school and it's known for that so a lot of people flock there to party and it just wasn't for me and it's it, expensive too right it, it's up to with room and board and tuition for an out-of-state freshman it's around sixty-seven thousand. i'm pretty sure my kids can party in state did you say sixty-seven thousand? yeah mm -hmm. for a year for room and board and tuition that's what a year i, I knew people paying that yeah. Now you know why the crazy lady in the pool. She probably put two kids through there and <laughs> it did her in. <laughs> right. Drove her crazy. <laughs> okay. So where did you go from the Toyota dealership? After Toyota, I went across country and my first job in California was a grocery store. I'm in Huntington Beach and it was the model store and it was one of the most miserable jobs I've ever had. Why is that? A grocery store is a place where they, they know you're a bad worker. They're not going to fire you because it's really hard to nowadays. They're going to have the person who does work hard do your job for you. And I was that guy that did everyone's job for them. We would have duties every day, like chores. I ended up doing more than half the chores. And the chores were taking garbage out, sweeping floor, stuff that no one wants to do. Whenever a customer would drop a gallon glass jar of vinegar, I was the one for some reason having to pick it up. Stuff like that happened. Did you get a discount? Um, I would only get a discount after I paid $200 to join the union. That took several months to get a chance to even join the union. So I never received my 5% discount. 5% is not worth anything. No, it is In isn't. my opinion. It's ridiculous. I mean, we just pay retail anyway. <laughs> Going out of our way for 5%. You know, I'm $5 off $100? I mean, yeah. what's that? So we have to rewind. We forgot a job in Vermont. A job I worked... Bef right before I went to UVM, I transferred from a community college in Vermont. I worked at Ben & Jerry's factory for the fall after I graduated high school. And that was a really interesting job because I, like, I was really exposed to blue collar, factory work. 
Um, and it really made me push to get my degree as quick as I could. People are very paranoid about breaking anything, getting in trouble, someone replacing them. I was a temp, so people were very scared of me. I received a position where they needed people and people wanted me in that position, so people weren't too fond of me. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, it was a very aggressive atmosphere. People were very miserable. People loved to ride out on each other. What was your job then? I would work these really expensive robots at the end of the industrial line. I would take a forklift and pick up the pallet of almost 10 feet of ice cream. And I'd pick it up with the forklift. i move it to a position where another forklift would take it and stack it in the large freezer behind us. Other than that, I would do some maintenance of cleaning, but it was pretty simple and repetitive. Some days you wouldn't move a pallet for over an hour and you would just sit there staring at a clock. But yeah, I was just pretty much moving ice cream off an industrial line to an area where another forklift would pick it up and stack it in the freezer. Did they train you on the forklift? They did. Forklifts are fun. Um, they're hard to drive in a freezer because when you hit ice, you'll start to skid. And if you crash into any of the pillars, you're going to wreck a pillar or these large, really large stacks of ice cream that go up to about 50 to 60 feet, if not more. And they'll just have a domino effect of all the other rows of stacks of ice cream. No pressure there. Yeah. yeah. Explain the ice cream because the way I'm visualizing it, it's just a giant block that's not in a container. Um, Are they in containers? Is it before I, they get put in a container? My brother worked in that the um, packaging area, and he saw where you put in ingredients and it all go through a machine, and the machine packages it all for you. So when it would come to me, it would be in the pints already, packed in plastic mm -hmm. sleeves. And there's probably like five to 600, if not more, pints on one pallet, and those get stacked about 10 to 15, maybe 20 high in a big warehouse. So it's just this never ending warehouse of ice cream, which is the freezer. So could you eat ice cream while you're driving the forklift? No, you weren't allowed to eat in the factory and you get in a lot of trouble if you did. The guy who I worked with pretty much every shift and who had trained me, he broke a $2 million robot when we were both on the clock. They didn't make this robot or any of the parts for it anymore as it was made in Japan and the company I don't even believe was still in business. So when he broke it, he ran off and left me to sit there. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there laughing because I'm just a temp and I know they're not going to hire me and I thought it was kind of funny. But it really wasn't his fault. The thunderstorm hit the electrical box outside for the factory so everything froze up and glitched out and then the robot starts smashing itself into the walls. Big robot arm that sorts the ice cream and puts it on the back on the line and moves it along. So I put my affidavit in and no one gets in trouble. He doesn't lose his job. The robot doesn't work anymore and it was the main line robot for three weeks we had to manually stack thousands and thousands and thousands of sleeves of ice cream so about eight pints is in a sleeve and you just it's it was like stacking hay by ice cream and everyone was mad at us and they have to come from their department and help us stack ice cream for hours no extra hiring no <laughs> yep and they didn't hire anyone during this not even some more attempts nope is he still employed there no, he quit a few weeks after I think I left. There's a lot of families that work at factories together. Like my brother's working there, my mom worked there for a little bit. His family worked there and I went back to, I was working my pool secretary job at the time and one of his brothers was going to the gym and told me that he had quit. Didn't sound like it was his fault. No. You know? He just happened to be standing there at the time. Yeah, yeah. he was trying to, the machine started glitching out so he tried to fix it. So he pressed a button, but the machine was going to break itself anyway. So he would have been the hero if he fixed it. Yeah. Yeah. Not this time. Okay, so now you're in California. So... You're at the grocery store. I'm doing the grocery store, which is driving me crazy. I prefer to do carts because I'm away from everyone. I'm outside. I'm in the sun. I can almost see the beach from the grocery store. So kind of just bite my tongue and get through that job. In the meantime, I'm working DoorDash, which is food delivery which I liked at the time because I was able to drive around, see the area. Some days I'd make really good money, some days I'd make nothing for money. But after I left Huntington Beach, I moved to Santa Barbara to go to school. I had friends up there, so I was able to land an apartment. And my first job was at uh, in Suites, and I was front desk there. That was an interesting job, but I had to quit because I was on the beach one night, around midnight, 
I live on the ocean. I live a street off of the ocean. So my friend and I were on a bench and these two hooded figures walked up to us and pulled the knife and they thought we were someone else. And they ended up being, well, one of them ended up being my coworker. So the next day I go into work, I'm like trying to figure out how I'm gonna quit. I'm making coffee, I turn around and it's the guy who pulled the knife on me and we just quickly say hi. I don't spill my coffee or anything. I go to the desk. I finally just tell my manager, like, I have to leave this job for a certain reason that I cannot say. We have a special meeting. Till this day, everyone at, job, at the job knows me as the guy who just left and ruined everyone's schedule. And I see them all around Santa Barbara and they still question me. And for my safety, I don't say why I left. I don't want to get the guy in trouble. Why leave? I mean, he, he wasn't going to bother you again, right? Uh, I don't know. That's the thing. Uh -oh. It was just so awkward. Yeah. It was just really awkward. Yeah. Okay. So from the hotel, I went to my first valet job, working in a random parking lot, triple stacking cars, and I met several celebrities. Um, I met one of the dads for Arrested Development. I met... Who's that? Jason Bateman? The larger guy, the gay couple. From Arrested Development? Or are you thinking Modern Family? Modern Family. Your modern yeah. family. Yeah, no, yeah, he's really not gay. The red Yeah, yeah, he, he, he came with his wife. Oh, okay. Um, Oprah came to our lot, but I wasn't able to talk to her, go near her. Like what her kind security. of car did she have? I think she had a Bentley or a Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. The guy from Modern mm -hmm. Family had a nice Range Rover. A lot of other celebrities kind of made their way in and out. Um, who was the biggest jerk celebrity that you ever came in contact with, and who was the nicest? Uh, I never really had any incidents with the celebrities. They keep it really short and sweet. They just throw you five, ten bucks to keep you quiet. The only jerks I met were just some locals or people who didn't want to pay because it's ten dollars to park for two hours. That's a deal. I know. And there's also free parking across the street, so we instruct them how to go there and they just get more mad. But that was probably my best valet job. I drove the nicest cars, made the most money, was treated the best by the customers. We had monthly members. I still am friends with some of them, and they'd invite me to after parties in their work, and it was really fun. And they'd always be gifting us whatever, wherever they worked. They'd give us gifts from there, and then... Who's that? The monthly members. And then we'd have transit vehicles, and they would kind of come in for weddings and restaurants and showings. Because we were a parking lot surrounded by really nice wineries, and then we were surrounded by a really nice theater with really, really exotic showings. And then we were surrounded by venues where weddings were held. So we would get large group events, but mainly we would cater to the monthlies during the day. And then at night we would have events. And the monthlies, since they had memberships, they didn't tip every day. So they would help us out in other ways by giving us wherever they worked. Um, we'd get discounts at Chipotle, the gym. We had free gym memberships. A lot of free burritos and tacos from the restaurants and the local shops around us. That's nice. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Are you still at that job? No, I left that job because the managers changed and I just want, I want to change after working there for almost two years. I kind of just felt like I needed to move on from the parking lot. I moved to a hotel in the ocean. It's a three-star hotel. I was a valet bellman. It wasn't a bad job. The only issue I had with the job was that I had to carry heavy bags up the staircase without elevators. <gasps> oh my god. It was a three-minute bike ride on the ocean from my house, so it was perfect. I could bike home for lunch, bike back down. It was it was a really good setup. I probably should have stayed, but I left for a five-star, which ended up being the worst experience for work. Worse than any of the farms, worse than the grocery store. The only job I've quit and just didn't give a notice and just left and never came back and ignored it everything after that. What was so bad? Um, the manager, who had worked there for several decades, and he was aggressive, would get in your face, really manipulative. And they kept this guy for decades? Yeah, because no one else wants to work this position. Oh. So he would take our tips and then distribute them equally, which I didn't yeah. trust. A lot of the bellmen, and uh, yeah, the bellmen, they, I, I just noticed a lot of tip stealing. I had a lot of tips stole within the few weeks I worked there. I'd watch it, and they would know I'm aware of it, but since I knew you, no one says anything at a job like that. And I just couldn't take the job serious. I didn't want to be there. There was no money there. I was commuting 30 minutes in my car, which wasn't running well. So I left that job very quick and did not enjoy the five-star experience. It seems like no matter where you work, there's always a catch. I guess that's with everything in life. Like Something you, that ruins it? Yeah. Definitely in the service industry, there's always this one issue there. And yeah. Usually the manager. But at the previous job, I liked my manager a lot. It was just the labor of carrying heavy bags upstairs was too much. 
How many floors was it high? We had, you could go up to the third floor. I always got stuck belling to the third floor. We only had a few rooms on the third floor, but you'd literally have to walk probably about 200 yards down a boulevard sidewalk with the bell cart, then bring it to the staircase. All the buildings were separated and then carried up three flights of stairs. We only had two valets usually on shift. So you're supposed to be a valet and a bellman. So you have all this luggage and they have all these cars and it's a small parking lot and it's alleyways. And it was just, you're just set up for a disaster. You know, the common theme here is I just won't hire enough people. And they love to not pay overtime. Yeah, it's just like they'll break the few people they have. It would be nice to have someone watch your luggage, someone park your car, and, and few guys to take the luggage up. It's just crazy. Well, it's all about money. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's disgusting, I think. Yeah. So, I left the service industry for good. I'm not going back. I'm gonna finish up my undergrad, and I am taking on the position of an extern in Washington, D.C. I've noticed that it's the one job where people are not at each other's throat every second of the day. It's the most laid back atmosphere that I've worked in. Everyone gets along very well. And it's just very interesting to me how a job with a lot more true stress and more possible consequences has people more laid back. Well, I think the key is not for profit. Oh, That's right. the difference. Right. You know, and I would say 90% of the workforce is educated, highly educated from the best schools. Explain the difference between intern and extern. So an intern is paid and an extern is not paid and they're leaving the job after a certain amount of time. Where an intern, I think, has the chance to come into the job if they do a good job and they are needed. Is your externship motivating you to continue with your education yes. as much as your bad jobs were? Yes. It's showing me that there is light at the end of the tunnel. After college, I, I, I think I'll enjoy working a professional career, even though a lot of people say college is the best time of your life. I don't necessarily, necessarily believe so because of how much it costs and the stress it causes. I believe young professional is the best time of your life. Being a young professional, you have you still have your youth, you still can go out, you can be professional one weekend, party, party the next, vice versa, and you're making money to sustain your living. You can pay for your cost of living while service industry and being in college, you can't afford your rent or your college at the time. You're just mm -hmm. taking debt on debt just to continue, <laughs> and it's really stressful. Yeah, but there's truly, a payoff at the end, hopefully. That's, yeah. that's what you're seeing in the externship, right? Yeah. Like it will all pay off or potentially could. Yeah. How do you like working in an office versus a factory versus a farm? Um, I like the office the most. I mean, there's air conditioner, comfortable seats. You don't have to battle for pens or anything. I didn't mind the parking a lot because we'd go into nice wineries or restaurants and use their bathroom and they give us filtered special water and sparkling water. But I mean, you are working in a parking lot. You have to carry homeless people out of the parking lot and put them on the bench outside. You literally they're not have to carry them? Some people would, I didn't touch them, but we would usually just call the cops and they would have to come move them. We weren't even necessarily supposed to due to insurance reasons, but they would either collapse in our parking lot and we'd have to move that car or they would be too drunk and they wouldn't get out. Sometimes they would be on the border of the parking lot and they would end up urinating themselves. Something would happen and then it'd be on the parking lot and then you'd do it. It was, it was, it had its downfalls. What do you like better? The rural Vermont, the city of Washington, or kind of the beach city in California? I would have to take the beach city of California, um, especially Santa Barbara. When you're in a California city, you can escape pretty quick. D.C. there is a lot of congestion, um, but it's a really historic city, so it's very interesting to be in. While you're just commuting, you can walk by the National Monument. It's a nice city because it has its own perks. I just prefer the weather of Santa Barbara over the weather of Washington, D.C. What do you see yourself doing in the future? I, I definitely enjoy office work the most. I w would like to be a consultant at the end of the day, but I think I'll have to prove myself in a private firm, maybe work with the government before I can start consulting. But as of now, I, just, I think an office job is gonna fit me well that ties to economics. For any of our listeners out there, if you're hiring. Yeah, he knows how to deal with lots of personalities. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. What advice do you have for teenagers that are not happy with their current situation? 
like as if they're going to college like well or... just like you it took a lot of courage for you to uh, get in a car and drive cross country yeah. and take a risk was Did... that worth it was it yeah. hard was it easy was there a payoff it's really hard to gain residency you have to be really financially independent which was why I worked all these weird jobs so I could support myself financially I would recommend researching the researching the area you plan on moving to. All just start calling schools and jobs and just ask 20 questions, if not more. Figure out the residency requirements in the state, the transfer requirements from city college or community college to university. If you can get like loans, like Parent Plus loans or loans from a parent that are private, do that instead of working because the stress of work is going to kill you before you finish school and it's gonna inflict your grades and it's gonna have a really negative impact on your view of college and education and on your education itself because it's gonna really hurt your grades. But just really research where you're going to, the cost of living, the job from the school that you wanna end up at. How much bad influence uh, did you have in each job? Was there a lot of people trying to um, offer drugs? Is it bad? There's a lot of drug use in it to stay up with the work, of pay, the, stay with the pace of work. But they didn't push you. No one's mm. pu- no one pushed anything on you. No, no. Okay, um, nothing like that. I have friends in restaurants, the restaurant industry, where cocaine is yeah. pretty big. To, so servers are always trying to get the young people in to do the cocaine with them in the back. And um, a lot of the chefs can work several jobs. They do a lot of cocaine or they smoke meth to get through their several jobs a day. But just being in California, the drug use is really high. So, I mean, everyone's pretty much high all the time. The vaporizer pens being THC or nicotine are always being passed around. But, yeah, I would say cocaine is the one that's pushed on by a lot of people just because it keeps people moving and energized and you feel good. And five of my roommates work in restaurants and bars and drinking on the job is a big thing in restaurants. Yeah. I worry the most about restaurant work for my kids mm-hmm. because of the drinking and the drugs in restaurant work. Oh, yeah. And they form cliques and they go out together afterwards and they do all that stuff. And it's just it's just like a little soap opera world in yeah. every restaurant. Mm-hmm. That's why a lot of people, I think, stay in the service industry because it's, jobs, it's a job that pays fairly well depending on your position and what restaurant you're at. And it's a social outlet at the same time. And being young, you're looking to go out and have fun, and your job, if it's providing that, it seems like the best thing ever. I've seen a lot of people get lost in the service industry and drop out of school, whatever they're doing, and just work at this restaurant where they're making good money in their eyes, but they're meeting a lot of friends, and they're just, they're having the time of their life, but they're really just lost in this industry, because within a year, all these people are gonna be gone, and they're gonna be stuck there as they had just dropped out of school with nothing. What do you think about the education system in our country? I believe for most degrees it's a huge market. Some degrees like pre-med, engineering, degrees that follow that line are worth it. But I just see that it's becoming a huge market. I believe in being educated but I don't believe in paying large amounts for it. And I think it's just becoming more of a market than it is an education system. But I believe everyone should be educated so we can keep advancing as a country. but. I think it's becoming more about the money than ever has been. And the student loan debt crisis is going to blow up in our face in about a decade. And the stress. It seems very stressful. Having to work and pay for your school and figure out the residency. Yeah. Well, I have an idea on that. I think parents should put their money into buying their kids a place to live so that the place appreciates, so they're making money and they have an affordable place to live, and then let the kid go to school on their own time at their own pace. And then that way you have a reasonable place to live, it's affordable, it's making money for you, and you go to school slowly. Yeah, I mean, that's one approach. A lot of kids don't have parents that can buy their kids a house or, you know, a place to live or paying for it on their own. And I think that's so stressful. That's why we have kids in our basements. That's right, yeah. (laughs) And you know, they've also said for parents too, they've said this about 10 years ago, don't pay for your child's schooling. Keep it in your retirement. That way your kids don't have to take care of you when they're older. You know, you can still take care of you and then they can get student loans and that would be the way to go. But you know what, I don't know if I trust anything anymore of what they tell you to do. (laughs) I think it's probably just the opposite, so who knows, you know? I don't think there's one size fit fits all. No. You know, and there's definitely opportunities for every kid between community college and oh, whatever, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it's doable, but it's stressful and expensive. 
for sure. And there's no guarantee when you get out that there's a job waiting for you. All right. Yeah, I think it's hard. So do you have any lessons learned or any other advice you want to pass along? Yeah, just I advise people to go to community college. Your first two years really do not matter from what I've heard from many older adults that employers will not even look at your first two years in most cases. I don't know how true that is, but I've been told by many people. Your first two years don't matter, so community college is usually fair price, free in California for residents. So I advise, highly advise, go to community college. Yeah, sounds like a good path. Yeah, good advice. Okay, Eric, well, thank you so much for joining us on Conversations with Carol and Cheryl. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Carol.